Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dion and today we're going to do something different. We have the parts of what is actually a very simple watch movement on the bench, but that's still a lot of parts, so how do we know where they're going to fit? Well, there is a very clear method to the madness, uh, so let's have a look at it. First of all, we need like a platform to uh, put all these different parts on, and that is what's called a main plate. On the main plate, you can see there's a lot of cutouts for different parts. And those tiny red circles are uh, rubies. Synthetic, so not very valuable, but uh, still rubies. So we say that a watch runs, and anything that runs needs to have some power. And that power in the mechanical watch is provided by this big ass spring called the main spring. And we're going to coil that whole main spring into that little barrel on the left side there. And yes, getting that whole thing into that little barrel is a little bit like uh, trying on last year's uh, summer clothes. And the barrel actually has some teeth on it, so it's also a wheel. And we're going to use that to drive these other wheels. Now, since the barrel is a wheel, it's the first wheel. So uh, the second wheel is the one on the left here, third, fourth. And then you have this small silver wheel, which is special, and we call it the escape wheel. And to help keep all these wheels in place, we have the train bridge there with the jewels in it. Now all the gears in the train will not uh, run unless we wind the mainspring. And we have some components needed on both sides of the main plate for doing that, including the crown and stem, of course. But power is nothing without control, so we need something to regulate it. And we also want to make sure that power from the mainspring is released in uh, equal increments of time. And finally, we need something to help show the time. So basically move the hands around the dial. And we need something to help uh, keep all these things in place. And for that, we have uh, screws. There are much more than these six screws in the movement, but these are the six different types of screws there are. So let's start with the energy source. We said we need to get this uh, mainspring into the barrel, but we also need to be able to wind the mainspring once it's inside the barrel. The thing we use to uh, wind the mainspring is called the barrel arbor. And on the barrel arbor, there's this little hook, which fits into the eye on the inner loop of the mainspring. Normally I would say be very careful with hooks around eyes, but uh, for this one, go for it. The other end of the mainspring has a bridle which stops against the cutout in the barrel wall. And that way the mainspring doesn't slip inside the barrel when we wind it. Now, one thing about watchmakers, they are tool junkies. Some of the tools are absolutely necessary, like mainspring winders, because putting the mainspring into the barrel by hand will damage it. This tool has a lot of different sizes of barrels and barrel arbors. And then we use this plunger to actually press uh, the mainspring into the actual barrel. And with the mainspring inside the tool there, we'll look where this bridle is now. So we can align that with uh, the cutout in the barrel wall. And then we press it in. And after lubricating a little bit on top of the mainspring, we can put uh, the barrel arbor with that hook into the eye. So right now the mainspring is relaxed inside the barrel, but if we wind it, the mainspring is going to start coiling around the barrel arbor instead. We'll put the barrel lid back on, and then our energy source is ready. The barrel is the first wheel in the train. The second wheel is commonly called the center wheel. And we see the center wheel has a really long arbor. That arbor has a little indentation on it. And at the bottom of the arbor, you see the pinion of the center wheel. And the barrel teeth then mesh with the pinion and thus rotates the whole wheel. So that long arbor on the center wheel goes through the center hole on the main plate. And then we're going to use that to connect the two sides of the main plate later. Note that all the other wheels also have pinions on them. And the second wheel drives the third wheel pinion, 
third wheel drives the fourth with pinion and so forth. And with the whole train in place, we should be able to run it by rotating the barrel a little bit. But no. And the reason, of course, is that the wheels aren't stable. So we're going to stabilize them by putting the bridges on. In the bridges are tiny jewels that have holes in the middle. And the ends of the arbors on the wheels run inside these drill holes. We call the ends of the arbors pivots, by the way. And the pivots are very highly polished. And when they rotate inside the jewel holes, there's very little friction. And less friction means a smoother power and transfer from the barrel, but also uh, that your watch will run longer. All right, with the train in place, let's see how we can use the crown to uh, wind the watch and set the time as well. Most important is this uh, squared off section of the stem. We're going to put two small pinions on the stem. On the left, we have the winding pinion. And on the right, we have the sliding pinion. And the sliding pinion has a square hole, which then, of course, fits with a square portion of the stem. Now, the winding pinion actually rotates freely on the stem. But if we press the sliding pinion against uh, the winding pinion, then the winding pinion will also rotate when we turn the crown and thus wind the watch. I'm going to lubricate uh, the teeth again. Anytime there's metal rubbing against metal, we want to lubricate a little bit. So the same thing with the stem. And with the stem in, we see that uh, when we turn the crown, what we wrote it is actually the sliding pinion. But if we push the sliding pinion against uh, the winding pinion, we wrote it the winding pinion as well. If you look closely, there's a little screw sticking up here. I didn't mention it then, but we put this on under the barrel bridge. And this is a screw for the setting lever. And the setting lever has a little uh, nubbin that goes into one of the grooves on the stem. And it allows us to hold the stem in place. And you see the lever itself also moves when we move uh, the stem in and out. And with the sliding pinion clutched onto the winding pinion, we see that uh, the winding pinion also comes out on the other side of the main plate. And we can then use that to put on the crown wheel. The crown wheel, we see it has teeth that meshes with the winding pinion. So by turning the crown, we're going to turn the crown wheel. That in itself doesn't really do too much. But if we look at uh, the barrel arb sticking out of the barrel bridge, we see it's square. So we can put a square hold ratchet wheel on top of that uh, barrel arbor and screw it down into the barrel arbor. And when we turn the crown now, we can see that uh, the entire train moves. The last piece of the motion works is to put on this uh, click. The click uh, has a couple of functions, but uh, it really allows us to uh, control uh, how much we wind the watch and also that uh, the watch doesn't unwind by itself. But we still see that uh, the train runs uh, freely. There's nothing to stop it. There's nothing to regulate the power coming out of the mainspring. So to do that, we're going to put in uh, the pallet fork. The pallet fork has two uh, jewels as well. One is the entry pallet and the other is the exit pallet. And what then enters and exits are the escape wheel teeth. And what happens is that uh, one of the teeth will lock on the side of the pallet stone and will only be released if something uh, makes the fork move from side to side. It's by the way a beautiful movement, very nicely decorated. It's an Eberhardt Traversatolo, belongs to a good friend of mine. With the pallet fork locking the escape wheel, we see that uh, we can wind the train without uh, the train moving. But if we move the fork from side to side, 
we see the lock on one tooth is released and the escape pull rotates a little tiny bit before it locks against the other pallet. Now sitting there moving that pallet fork back and forth yourself isn't really optimal for timekeeping. So we're going to use the balance instead. On the balance we have this little jewel as well called the impulse pin. And that impulse pin will then hit the inside of the pallet fork from uh, each side as it rotates and thus make the watch run. But before putting the balance on, we're going to also lubricate uh, the pallet stones. We lubricate the uh, exit stone, put a little tiny drop of uh, oil there, and then we'll let it run through a few teeth. And that way, and we also reduce friction there. Now, before we put the balance in, there's one thing we have to do, and that is to put in the shock protection for the balance. The balance wheel pivots are extremely thin, typically 0.1 millimeter in the wristwatch. So you can imagine those break easier than the New Year's resolution on the 2nd of January. And there's shock protection, of course, on both uh, pivots. And they consist of a chaton, which is basically a holder. And into the chaton fits the cap jewel, which the pivots rest on. We're also going to put some uh, lubrication on those uh, cap jewels. And then we can uh, put the chaton on top. And yes, it's very tiny. And man, does something need a haircut. We'll put the shock setting in and close the spring on top. And then we can put the balance in. See that it starts uh, running. We haven't really wound the watch much, so it's not going to run too well quite yet. That's good. Let's first put in uh, the shock setting and lock it down with a tiny spring. So when you see how small these parts are, uh, who do you think spends the most time on their knees? A watchmaker or two one-year-old babies? It's a little bit fickle to uh, wind the watch because that uh, sliding pinion keeps sliding away from uh, the winding pinion. So we're going to put in this uh, so-called yoke that fits into that groove on the sliding pinion. And with a strong spring on it, it's going to nicely push the sliding pinion towards the winding pinion and let us wind the watch much easier. Now one thing we need to do is get uh, the power from the train side over to the dial side. And we do that by pressing the so-called cannon pinion onto the arbor of the center wheel. And the cannon pinion is actually what we will press the minute hand onto. And given that we have to adjust the watch sometimes, we also need to be able to uh, rotate the minute hand without disturbing the whole train. And the way we do that is by uh, pushing the sliding pinion into meshing with the time setting train. And the time setting train uh, this goes from uh, the stem, from the sliding pinion, through the minute wheel that we're putting on here all the way to the cannon pinion. And with all that in place, we can also put in this uh, setting lever spring. And that one simply allows us to have a nice little uh, firm click in and out whenever we're changing uh, the crown from going to time setting to winding. And that means that we almost built the whole watch. We need to see if it actually runs okay. So we're first going to oil those uh, jewel holes a little bit and then we can fully wind the watch. We just keep winding until it stops. And when the mainspring is fully wound, you see that the click also acts as a little safety feature. So you cannot overwind the manual watch without really trying. Before testing if uh, the watch runs uh, accurately, we're going to demagnetize it. On the time grapher, there's a couple of things we want to look at. But first, we need to make sure that we're getting the right stats. And we do that by setting the lift angle. And the lift angle is uh, how many degrees out of the 360 rotation uh, possible is the impulse pin in contact with the pallet fork. So a couple of the readings of uh, importance, the amplitude and the beat error. 
So the amplitude is uh, how far the balance wheel swings from side to side. The ideal value uh, varies actually quite a bit with uh, the movement maker and with the age of the watch and what have you. In general, uh, you should have it around 270 to 315 for a new watch. It can be lower for a Seiko, for instance, or for a vintage watch. The beat error is basically how far to the left or the right of center the impulse pin is. If the impulse pin is completely in the center of the pallet fork uh, when uh, the watch is standing still, then you would have zero beat error, like we managed to get here. So if the watch now is running very nicely, how do we actually show that on the dial? I mentioned already that uh, the cannon pinion is what we put the minute hand on, but where do we put the hour hand? Now, of course, the hour hand needs to go around the dial once per 12 hours. So 12 times slower than uh, the minute hand. And the way that is done is by putting the hour wheel on top of the cannon pinion, but let it mesh with the pinion on top of the minute wheel. So what? The cannon min pinion? Um, min can cannon pinion meal? Meal wheel? Minute pinion wheel? Yeah, pretty much. And if the maker counted all the teeth on the wheels and pinions correctly, you should get the right uh, ratio of 1 to 12. So that the hour wheel goes around one time, while the cannon pinion goes around 12 times. Phew, that was uh, not easy to explain and probably not easy to understand either. Anyway, we're putting the hour hand on that hour wheel that we just uh, put onto uh, the top of uh, the cannon pinion. The second hand on this uh, movement is actually uh, on the fourth wheel pivot. So the fourth wheel goes through the main plate and through the dial side. And then we can put the second hand on it, which also then means that the fourth wheel goes around the dial once per minute. So there's a lot of calculation on the number of teeth, etc., in a movement like this. And this movement is pretty much the simplest you can get in a watch that does show the seconds. So not only are watchmakers uh, muscular hunks, they're also uh, good at counting them, apparently. You can at least count to 12. All right, we have uh, cased the movement. I'm gonna put the screws back in. And this whole movement is just beautiful to, uh, to look at. Does, of course, have a display case back. That is probably why the decorated movement so nicely in the first place. The last thing we're going to do before uh, putting the strap back on is to uh, screw on the display case back. Whenever you're working on a watch like this, you want to make very sure we have uh, the proper screwdriver and that it's uh, fit for the screw slots. So we don't slip and make some uh, bad scratches or any scratch. All right, let's get the strap on so we can admire this beauty on the wrist. There we go. That's the right way to uh, wear a watch like this. Honestly, we know what time it is from our phone or whatever, but just watching this movement tick, that is something special. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then clicking like and subscribe will certainly help the channel. You can also share it on social media. You should try out the new uh, YouTube clips feature if you haven't. We'll be back shortly with another video. Until then. Ta-ta.